blood of the Lamb. On this, your holy Shabbat, it is an honor to gather together as your people Israel. We are natural branches. We are grafted in, but we are one in Messiah Yeshua. I thank you, Holy One, for teaching us your ways, for opening the eyes of our understanding, for enlightening us to the hope of your calling. Father, reveal your word to us today. Teach us your way. Reveal your heart to us. We want to know you, Father. We want to know you, Yeshua, and the power of your resurrection. We give you the praise and the honor and the glory for it. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen and amen. Ha'azinu is our Torah portion this week, and it means give ear. It's from Deuteronomy, Devarim 32, verses 1 through 52. And our memory verse was all about the Torah being on our life. And that's the last part of the chapter. We're going to go ahead, start reading at verse 1, Deuteronomy 32. This is Moses. He's saying, listen, heavens, while I speak. Hear, earth. The words that I shall say, he's speaking for Yahweh. May my teaching fall like rain. May my true word drop down like the new dew, like showers on the grass, like light rain on the turf. For I shall proclaim the name of Yahweh. Oh, tell the greatness of our God. He is the rock. He is our rock. He is our foundation. He is everything. He is the creator. He's he's the redeemer. He is everything. He is our rock. He goes by the rock. The rock that the builders rejected is Yeshua. His work is perfect, for all his ways are equitable. A trustworthy God who does no wrong. He is the honest, the upright one. They have acted perversely, those he fathered, without blemish, a deceitful and underhand brood. Is this the return you make to Yahweh, O people, brainless and unwise? Is this not your father who gave you being? Who made you by whom you subsist? Think back on the days of old. Think over the years, down the ages. Question your father. Let him explain to you, your elders, and let them tell you. When the Most High gave the nations each their heritage, when he portioned out the human race, he assigned the boundaries of nations according to the number of the children of God. But Yahweh's portion was his people. Jacob was to be the measure of his inheritance. In the desert, he finds him. In the howling expanses of the wastelands, he protects him, rears him, guards him as the pupil of his eye. Like an eagle watching its nest, hovering over its young, he spreads out his wings to hold him. He supports him on his pinions. Yahweh alone is his guide. No alien God for him. He gives him the heights of the land to ride. He feeds him on the yield of the mountains. He gives him honey from the rock to taste and oil from the flinty crag, curds from the cattle, milk from the flock, and the richness of the pasture, rams of Bashan's breed, and goats, the richness of the wheat kernel, the fermented blood of the grape for drink, wine. Jacob has eaten to his heart's content. Jeshurun, grown fat has now lashed out. You have grown fat, gross, bloated. He has disowned the God who made him and dishonored the rock, his salvation, whose jealousy they aroused with foreigners. With things detestable, they angered him. They sacrificed to demons who are not God, to gods hitherto unknown to them, to newcomers of yesterday whom their ancestors had never respected. You forgot the rock who fathered you, the God who made you, you no longer remember. Yahweh saw it, and in anger, he spurned his sons and daughters. I shall hide my face from them, he said, and see what will become of them, for they are a deceitful brood, children with no loyalty in them. And this is the thing that we need to take notice of. We owe him loyalty. We owe each other loyalty. That is one of the fruits of the Spirit, faithfulness. It's loyalty. It's what it's talking about. We've got to develop this because we've got a job to do, brothers and sisters. We have a harvest to bring in, and we have to know that we have each other's back. We've got a lot of work to do, and we can't do it as individuals. We have to be his army. We have to have unity in our midst. They have roused me to jealousy with a non-God. They have exasperated me with their idols. In my turn, I shall rouse them to jealousy with a non-people. I shall exasperate them with a stupid nation. 
Yes, a fire has blazed for my anger. It will burn right down to the depths of Sheol. It will devour the earth and all its produce. It will set fire to the footings of the mountains. I shall hurl disasters on them. On them I shall use up all my arrows. They will be weakened by hunger, eaten away by plague and the bitter scourge. Against them I shall send the fang of wild animals and the poison of snakes that glide in the dust. Outside the sword bereaves, while inside terror will reign. Young man and girl alike will perish, suckling and graybeard both together. This is what happened when Israel was invaded. This is part of the curse because they were partying at the Nova Music Festival, which was a celebration of wickedness. That was their choice. And it like tied his hands. He couldn't protect them when they chose to do the wickedness that they chose. I should crush them to dust, I said. I should wipe out all memory of them. Did I not fear the boasting of the enemy? But do not let their foes be mistaken. Do not let them say, we have got the upper hand, and Yahweh plays no part in this. What a short-sighted nation this is. How thoroughly imperceptive. Were they wise? They would succeed. They would be able to read their destiny. How else could one man rout a thousand? How could two put 10,000 to flight? Were it not that their rock had sold them, that Yahweh had delivered them up, but their rock is not like our rock. Our enemies cannot pray for us, for their vine springs from the stock of Sodom and from the groves of Gomorrah. Their grapes are poisonous grapes. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is snake's poison, the viper's cruel venom. He is he not safe with me sealed inside my treasury. Vengeance is mine. I will pay them back. Don't be dismayed, brothers and sisters. Everybody that's wicked in the world today will get their own. Yahweh is taking notes and he knows exactly what's going on. Nobody will be able to sneak around him for the time when they make a false step for the day of their ruin is close. Doom is rushing towards them. For he will see to it that their power fails, that neither serf nor free man remains. For Yahweh will see his people righted. He will take pity on his servants. Where are their gods then, he will ask, the rock where they sought refuge. Who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their libations? Let these arise and help you. Let these be the shelter above you. See now that I, I am he, and beside me there is no other god. It is I who dealt death and life. When I have struck, it is I who heal. No one can rescue anyone from me. Yes, I raise my hand to heaven, and I say, as surely as I live forever, when I have whetted my flashing sword, I shall enforce justice. I shall return vengeance to my foes. I shall take vengeance on my foes. I shall make my arrows drunk with blood, and my sword will feed on flesh the blood of the wounded and the prisoners, the disheveled heads of the enemy. Heavens rejoice with him. Let all the children of God pay him homage. Nations rejoice with his people. Let God's envoys tell of his power, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will return vengeance to my foes. He will repay those who hate him and purify his people's country. Moses came with Joshua son of noon and recited all the words of this song in the people's hearing when Moses had finished reciting the words to all Israel he said to them take all these words to heart I intend them today to be evidence against you you must order your children to keep and observe all the words of this law you must not think of this as empty words for the Torah is your life and by its means you will live long in the country which you are crossing the Jordan to possess Yahweh spoke to Moses that same day and said to him, Climb up this mountain of the Abarim, Mount Nebo, in the country of Moab, opposite Jericho, and view the Canaan, which I am giving the Israelites as their domain. Die on the mountain you have climbed, and be gathered to your people, as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor, and was gathered to his people. Because with the other Israelites you broke faith with me, at the waters of Meribah Kadesh, in the desert of Zin, because you did not make my holiness clear to the Israelites. You may only see the country from outside. You cannot enter it. 
the country which I am giving to the Israelites. We've got to be careful about wanting to be in a position of authority with Yahweh. If he's calling us to be that, we need to acknowledge it and we need to be faithful. But like James says in James 3, don't desire to be a teacher because teachers are going to give a greater account. Moses, when he got to that point of leading all of Israel, he made one mistake and it cost him an inheritance in the land. He got no possession. He did not get to enter in and take a portion of the inheritance because he sinned. He let his flesh get a hold of him. He got into anger. And we've got to learn the lessons of our forefathers. In 1 Corinthians 10, it says, All these things were written on for our example upon whom the end of the age come. So our Torah portion, the Song of Moses, is a call to repentance for Israel. Yahweh told the Israelites who rejected his Torah and Messiah, the Torah made flesh, that he would provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation and move them to anger by a foolish nation. Who exactly is supposed to provoke the lost Israelites? Look at Romans 11, verse 1. Say then, has God cast away his people? By no means. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How to make intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what says the answer of God to him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this time, also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel has not obtained that which he seeks for, but the election have obtained it. And the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this day. And David says, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their backs always. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? By no means, but rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy them who are my flesh and may save some of them. So Paul says he's doing this ministry to the Gentiles to provoke his Jewish brothers to jealousy. And how's he doing that? By being a better Jew than them. He's going out and doing what the master told him to do. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, Boast not against the branches, but if you boast, you bear not the root, but the root you. You will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of uh, unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. Take note, Gentiles, take note, Christians, the fear of Yahweh. This is the beginning of wis wisdom. We need to fear. Yahweh is our father, but he's also going to be our judge. Yeshua loves us, but he will have to hold us to account for what is written. It's an open book test, but we have to read the book. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he spare not you. Behold, good, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them who fell. Severity, but towards you, goodness, if you will continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also shall be cut off. So we have a daily responsibility to continue in his goodness, and that includes taking up our cross and following him, meditating in the Torah day and night, praying without ceasing. There's things he's told us to do, and it's our job to do them now. 
and in proportion to well, how faithful we are to do it is how successful we'll be in his kingdom. It's up to us. It's our choice. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. So the Jews can come back if they will embrace Yeshua. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree. And what's the good olive tree? We got a picture of it right here. He's, he's talking about his body, his people. How much more shall these which are the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles shall come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant to them when I take away their sins. Because the new covenant and the older covenant, all the covenants ever made with mankind, other than Noah's covenant, is made with Israel and Judah, not Gentiles and not a church. If you want to be in covenant with Yahweh, you have to be part of his people. Grafted into the good olive tree, become part of his menorah. The spirit of Yahweh needs to be in you, and you need to be part of his people. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But it's concerning the election. They are beloved for the father's sake. He made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he will not forget their seed. He made some promises, and God is not like man. He will not, not keep his promises. He will be faithful. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as you in times past have not believed God, you have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God has concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. So the Gentiles coming into the good olive tree are the people who are a foolish nation. A stupid people it even said in that one translation until you get the mind of Messiah. He wants to take out your stupidity and give you his mind. It's a pretty good swap. So Paul is one of those who is soon to be without a nation as well. Jerusalem's about to be defeated, about to be taken and destroyed, and the people scattered. And now look at 1 Peter 1. This is Peter writing, Peter, an apostle of Yeshua Messiah, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Yeshua Messiah. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. So Peter's writing to strangers. But look at 1 Peter 2, the next chapter, verse 4. Coming to him as to a living stone. He is that rock. He is that stone that we're coming to. Rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. Think the Lamb's wife, New Jerusalem, if you embrace all the covenants. Now, Peter's talking to a specific people group here, as we're going to see. And we need to take note of this, Gentiles. You don't have to stay a Gentile. Therefore, it is also contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to those that reject him. But he is our rock of foundation for us that receive him. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and to his marvelous light, who were once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And this is through Yeshua. So we know that Peter is talking to strangers who are Israelites. Look at Exodus 19.6. We know this is who it was initially spoken to. This is at Mount Sinai to the nation of Israel, mixed multitude included. 
And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, Exodus 19, 6, and a holy nation. This is what Peter's quoting. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. This is the physical nation of Israel. This is what Peter's talking about. Now, we can also tell that these strangers are probably Israelites by blood because of this promise that he made to them at Mount Sinai. Not, not all of them, the mixed multitude, didn't have the physical blood, but they became physical Israel, just the same. Look at Hosea 2.23. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people, and they shall say, you are my God. He's bringing Israel back. He's going to marry us again. He had to give us a divorce. We had never been consummated. It was like when Mary and Joseph, he found out she was pregnant. He was going to put her away. They'd never consummated the marriage, but it still had to be a legal divorce, even though it hadn't been legally consummated yet, because it was a contract. It was a ketubah. When we enter covenant with Yahweh through the new birth, that's our ketubah. It's our contract. It's not consummated yet, though. So we're still waiting. We're saved by faith. But we're waiting to become part of the lamb's wife in the future. After everybody th during the thousand-year reign is born and gets to live and make a choice, at the end, that's when the lamb's wife is revealed, and that's when the wedding supper of the lamb is going to be because everybody gets a chance to be part of it, not just here in this time and age, just when Yeshua is here too because a little child will become a mighty nation. There's going to be a population explosion on earth like we've never seen, physical people having physical children still, and they all get a chance to choose too because just because they're born during that time doesn't mean they make it. There's going to be a more death during that time than we've ever seen in the history of the world. When Satan's released for a season, he goes and corrupts the nation, and they ga gather as the sand of the seashore at Jerusalem, and fire rains down from heaven and wipes them all out. Mo the most death and destruction of any time in the history of the earth, right at the very end. So Hosea is also where Peter's quoting from, as we saw. Look at Hosea 1.1. The word of Yahweh that came to Hoshea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Joktan, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. In the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, when Yahweh began to speak to Hoshea, Yahweh said to Hoshea, Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from Yahweh. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And Yahweh said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bore a daughter. Then God said to him, Call her name Lo Ruhama, for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah. We'll save them by Yahweh, their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword or battle, by horses or horsemen. Now when she had weaned Lo Ruhamah, she conceived and bore a son. Then God said, Call his name Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There it shall be said to them, you are sons of the living God. This is how Israel was divided. It's what we just read, according to the sons of the living God. Then the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head. And they shall come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. So now not only is it the Jews who have rejected their Messiah that we are supposed to be provoking to jealousy, it is the Israelites who are not following Yahweh's Torah also. How can we provoke them to jealousy? This is Most Christians are probably from that line. Now, because there was a mixed multitude that came out, that's not a guarantee, but anybody that's interested in the Messiah of Israel, chances are it's because of the covenant he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who would be a blessing to all nations. In Matthew 5.43, it says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. 
Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect. You shall be mature just as your father in heaven is perfect. It's time to die to our flesh. It's time to let him live through us. That's how we're going to be perfect as he is perfect. So we can love them no matter what they do to us. Paul gives us another witness. I mean, we see Stephen being stoned by these guys saying, Lord, don't lay this into their charge. That provoked Paul. Yeshua was able to reach him because of Stephen laying it down, because of that, that unselfish love. Romans eleven twenty six says, and so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And then Romans 12, 19. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. Even though they're enemies for the sake of the gospel, he wants us to love them, to treat them with love. So we're to feed them. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on their, his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but co- become overcome evil with good. So the fire on the head is you're not burning them up. You're blessing them because their fire went out. That's what they would do in ancient days is they'd go borrow a coal from their neighbor, put it in a basket, put it on their head and take it home and then light, relight their fire with it. And so you're blessing them. And that blessing, that love will win them. Good will overcome evil every time. It is a spiritual force that Satan can't defeat. That's it. First Corinthians 13, 8. Love never fails. Acts 21, 20. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and they said to him, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed and they are all zealous for the Torah. This was James, Yeshua's brother, the leader of the assembly at Jerusalem. This was his praise of the Jews that believed in Yeshua. They were zealous for the Torah because it's all about spirit and truth. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what I tell you. You have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Now, this is the vow of the Nazarites, the only vow where you shave your head in the Torah. And it includes three animal sacrifices, one for sin, There's a couple of grain offerings involved and a libation offering. So there's like six sacrifices for each person. Paul's going to be paying for all of them, five of them, 30 different sacrifices. That's a lot of money to prove that he keeps the law. And that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the Torah. Because that's what Yahweh said. If you love me, keep my commandments. And we know Paul loved him. He was keeping his commandments and he was proving it by taking the vow of the Nazarite. So being zealous for the Torah and the Torah made flesh and not your religion will provoke Israel to jealousy. The reality is we need to be better Jews than they are. See, that's the thing. That's what I'm teaching these guys in in Pakistan. It's our job to provoke Israel to jealousy. And we only do it by being more obedient more blessed and more loving than what regular Jews are. And we can do it. We are actually grafted into the lion of the tribe of Judah. We become part of the perfect Jew. We're being conformed to the image of his dear son. So it should be natural for us. It is if we submit to his spirit, the leading of the spirit. So we need to be more loving and more obedient because of our, the love for our father. We don't do it to try to be saved. We try to do it out of respect for our father to show him that we love him. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And this is why we do it. Now, we're given a serious warning in Revelation chapter 18, verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his glory. 
And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. He's calling his people out of her because that's where his people are at right now, unfortunately. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Because there is judgment coming for Babylon and we don't want to be in her when it happens. So what are the, ins uh, the instructed to come out of Babylon? But how do we do that now? I mean, Babylon is over in Iraq. It's kind of landlocked and nobody's over there. Well, that's because that's not really what he's talking about. Where's his people? Stuck in the fake church. Sunday worship, where they reject Shabbat. They reject the day of Yahweh. And they substitute their own. And they think he's going to be happy about it. So one important way is to leave our former false systems of worship. We need to read the Bible. We need to see how Yeshua worshiped and do it the way he did, because we're supposed to be being conformed to him. So ecclesia is the word in the Greek manuscripts that's rendered church in our English translations. If you look in your English Bible, the word church, if you look in the Greek behind it, it will be ecclesia. So the English word church is neither a transliteration of ecclesia, nor is it a translation. So if ecclesia had been translated, it would have been called the, the called out or separated assembly or assembly of God in context of the Bible. And that's where that denomination got their name is they just translated the word. So the word church came originally from the old English word circe, which evolved into chirchi in Middle English, which evolved into chirchi and eventually into the modern spelling of church, which referred to a building to meet in and not the people. The original circe described the place of pagan worship. And the following entries are from the Oxford English or Universal English Dictionary. Church, it says Old English Circe or Circe, Middle English Churche, Churche. So you can see this is in the Oxford English Dictionary. This is this is where it came from. The word church is as closely to be properly used as possible in the King James Version in Acts 738 to describe the children of Israel in the wilderness. So Israel has always been the quote church. It's talking about his people, his body, his covenant. Now look at Ephesians 2:10. For we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yeshua unto good works, which God has prepared, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So they won't get us born again, but once we are, he expects us to walk in the good works. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, which means you're not anymore, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Messiah being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Messiah Yeshua, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Messiah. And then in verse 19, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, no longer Gentiles, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, you are grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. You become part of the body of the lion of the tribe of Judah, who's the perfect Jew. So you should look like a Jew. You should act like a Jew, like Yeshua did, because you're supposed to be like him. This is the whole point. So the word church in our English Bibles is referring to the commonwealth of Israel now, also called the body of Messiah. It's God's covenant people. Anybody who describes themselves as the one true church and is not identifying themselves with the commonwealth of Israel is in reality a cult. The Catholic Church is the biggest cult in all of creation. The Mormons, pretty big too. Jehovah Witnesses, Church of Christ, people we got this building from, they believe they're the only true church. Well, the fact is there's no true church at all because it's a mistranslation. You're grafted into the commonwealth of Israel or you're not his people. He doesn't have other sheep. Well, he does. He says, I have other sheep of a, in another fold. But he's talking about the northern kingdom that's still scattered. He's not talking about a bunch of Gentiles with no history. 
He's talking about the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he made a covenant with, and he's going to bring back to himself. So there are many others, other denominations that believe they're the one true church, and we should never participate with their false substitute system of worship, as this is not pleasing to our Father. We can love Sunday Christians. We can have a relationship with them so that we can share truth with them, but we're never to participate in their false worship. It's like, would you go to the church of Satan and have services with a friend to try to win them to Yeshua just because you want to do something for them? It's the same thing. I mean, it might not look as blatantly wicked on the outside, but it's as wicked as the golden calf was, and he put 3,000 people to death over that. They even made a holy day for Yahweh, and they used the right name. They just didn't follow his system of worship, and he didn't like it. Jeremiah 10.2 says, Thus says Yahweh, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the Gentiles are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are futile. For one cuts a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with an axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. And we know if we go on and read, they are actually bowing down and praying to it like it's a god. But we're not supposed to even look like that. I don't care if you have a Christmas tree. You say you don't bend down and pray to it. Well, you bend down to get the presents out from under it. It's almost the same thing. We know that you're not praying to it as a God. You understand the difference. But don't look like you are. God doesn't like any of it. It's not giving him glory. Did Yeshua do it? I don't think so. We shouldn't either. That's the whole point. We don't do stuff just because we can. Paul said to lay aside the sins and the weights, both of them. Get rid of all of it. If it's not glorifying to Yahweh and to Yeshua, don't do it. So these cults have set up their own pagan traditions that we're not to follow. Now, another abomination that they practice is Sunday worship in place of Yahweh's Shabbat. Now, the early believers worshiped every day, so it's not wrong to worship on Sunday unless you're substituting it for Yahweh's Sabbath. And then it's an abomination because you've rejected his day and you've set up a day in its place in his face to provoke him to wrath. That might not be your intention, but that's what it looks like to him. What's wrong with just doing what Yeshua did? It's not that hard. It's pretty easy to read, open your Bible and see how he did it. That's all we got to do. So this false system of worship claims to be following the Jesus of the Bible, but in reality, they're following a counterfeit Yeshua or Jesus that Paul warns us about. Look at 2 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Paul says, I wish, and this is the New Jerusalem Bible, I wish you would put up with a little foolishness from me. Not that you don't do this already. The jealousy that I feel for you, you see, God's own jealousy. I gave you all in marriage to a single husband, a virgin pure for pre presentation to Messiah. But I'm afraid that just as the snake in his cunning seduced Eve, your minds may be led astray from single-minded devotion to the Messiah who kept Torah, who is the Torah, because any chance comer has only to preach a Jesus other than the one we preached, or you have only to receive a spirit different from the one you received or a gospel different from the one you accepted, and you put up with that only too willingly. Satan's trying to deceive you guys. Read your Bible. Open it up. Don't just listen to your pastor. Look at Yeshua. He's going to be your judge. Do what Yeshua said to do. If he said it, it is forever settled in heaven. The way of salvation is not different from covenant to covenant. You might say, well, we're in a new covenant. Well, yeah, we are, but we're saved in exactly the same way, and it's by faith, and faith has to be perfected through obedience. So our obedience is just as crucial in this covenant as it was in the older one because we were saved by faith then. The only difference is we now have the Holy Spirit within us, so we should be way more obedient than they were in the older covenant. There should be no excuse for you to be lawless anymore, Christian other than your rebellion and your refusal to be like Yeshua. That's ultimately what you're doing. You're refusing to be like Yeshua. So the major doctrine of these cults that they teach, they're based in replacement theology, such as their being a church that's separate from Israel, which the Bible never teaches, the writings of the Tanakh being the Old Testament, which that page is never in any manuscript ever found, because it's not true, it's not old, it's forever settled in heaven. It's the Bible Yeshua preached from and that Paul preached from and all the apostles preached from. The pre-trib rapture fantasy. The church fantasy that there's something different. Eternal security. Hyper grace without obedience. And I mean, the list goes on. 
These are doctrines of demons. You need to understand this. Nobody in the Bible did these things, guys. This is the devil trying to take you to hell. You need to say no. Live your life the way that Yeshua lived it. He's the perfect man. How can you go wrong living like the perfect man? You can't. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Now, another thing that we're commanded to avoid is the use of the religious titles that these end time Babylonian substitute religious systems use. Look at Matthew 23, 1. Then spoke Yeshua to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, going to verse 8 now, but be you not called rabbi, for one is your rabbi, or is your master. Because this is what it means in Aramaic, the word rav. If you look up the Aramaic parts of the Bible where the word master appears, look at the Aramaic behind it, it's rav. The I on the end, it's, it's um, hirik in Hebrew. It makes it possessive, hirik gadal. So ravi, or rabbi, you're literally saying that that man that you're calling rabbi is my master. And Yeshua says, don't do that because you have one. And that's the Messiah. You are all brethren. We are not to use the title rabbi. And call no man your father upon the earth. He's not saying that you can't call your earthly father your father. He's saying don't use that religious title. For one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be you called masters. For one is your master, even Messiah. Now, in the ESV, we can see that that word translated as masters here is instructors. Or in the Geneva Bible, it was called doctors, the PhDs, the educated. He doesn't want us using fancy titles. He wants us to be brothers. Yeah, he wants us to grow and mature so that we can make disciples and grow them up to that place and then send them out. It's not so we can be something special. Yeshua is the special one. In the uh, Peshi or yeah, the Aramaic Peshitta, it says, do not be called guides, for one is your guide, the Messiah. We have a spirit guide. It's Yeshua. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. This is what we need to do. We need to serve his people. So this was also a prophesy about the end time religious titles of Babylon. Rabbinic Judaism uses the term rabbi. Catholic Christianity uses father. Religions like Buddhism and stuff use master. He does not want us using their titles. He doesn't want us to be proud. And he also doesn't want us using Babylonian religious titles because remember, Babylon was the habitation of every demon and a cage for every unclean bird. He doesn't want us participating in their demonic titles because it invites their demons into our ministry when we do. And we don't need that. He wants us separated. He wants us pure. So John 14, 26 says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the father will send in my name, he will teach you of all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said to you. So we don't need any man teaching us. Now, he uses men, but we're not just supposed to take their words. He goes on in John 14, 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father was send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things into your remembrance, whatever I have said to you. First John 2, 27, he says, but the anointing which you have received of him abides in you. And you need not that any man should teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth and is no lie, and even as it is taught you, you shall abide in him. And then again, Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. See, 35 years ago, when I dedicated my life to Yahweh again, I thought that I needed to go to Bible school because if you're serious and I, I knew he was calling me to minister, that's normally what you do is get some training. And I prayed about it. And my dad is a Rhema graduate, the original name it and claim it place. Prayed about going there. He said, no. And I said, OK, what about Victory Bible Institute? Billy Joe Doherty had it going on at the time. He said, no. Then Bob Yandine, who was a Rama uh, teacher at one time, he had his own school called School of the Local Church at Grace Fellowship. And he said, no, I want to teach you. And he ended, up, he ended up teaching me about Torah. You can't learn that in any Bible school today. So that's why he wouldn't let me go. You don't have to have a man to teach you. Now, it's way quicker if there's a man teaching you. And that's why he's made apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But the ultimate goal is that Yeshua would teach us ourselves. But because time is short, he's using these men now. He's letting me listen to other people now, whereas for 25 years, I wouldn't listen to anybody. He wouldn't let me other than the Torah. One time I went down and preached a Willie George message down in prison ministry, like early on when he was first starting to lead me. And he chewed me up one side and down the other, told me, don't you ever teach anything unless I've shown it to you. And then he showed me where it was wrong. And I had to go back and repent the next month. So 
he wants us to teach what he is revealing to us. In Ephesians 4.11, it says he gave himself to some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Messiah till we all come to the unity of the faith. He wants us on the same page and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Messiah that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, which means that if we're actually being filled and led by the Holy Spirit, we should all be teaching the same thing. There shouldn't be variation. We should be getting it from him, and he has one truth. So that's why the people that aren't being led by him need to sit down and stop teaching because you're just adding confusion. It's not a mental thing. You can go to college and learn things in a mental realm. You can learn to do geometry or whatever, but you can't go and learn the word of God it's got to be him that teaches you. These are all anointings because they're listed in 1 Corinthians 12 pretty much. And the same as gifts of healing, working of miracles, that of being a pastor or an evangelist. It's an anointing. It's not an office in the church. It is an anointing. And if you're not anointed to do that, please don't try. You can't drum it up yourself. You can get the training, but you're not going to do the body any service. You're going to be doing it a disservice because you're not going to be teaching what Yeshua taught. Because they don't know that in those Bible schools. Some of it is, some of it's not. The whole point is he wants to be our teacher. So we're supposed to speak the truth in love, and we may be able to grow up into all things, into him who is the head, Messiah, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth, to the body for the edifying of itself in love. So again, what about the apostles, prophets, teachers? We just talked about that. They're to challenge us to study. God will use them like he did with the Bereans. The Bereans wouldn't have been studying about Yeshua unless Paul had challenged them. So in Acts 17.10, it says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews, because it's to the Jew first, but also to the Gentile. These were more, more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind. So they listened and then searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They didn't just take Paul's word for it. They let him challenge them and then they went and proved it by the word. So back to the title rabbi. In John 1, 38, then Yeshua turned and saw, saw them following and said unto them, what do you seek? They said unto him, rabbi which is to be say, uh, interpreted master, because that's what it means, or literally my master, where do you dwell? In John 1, 49, Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. So we have one rabbi, and we're not to have another. It is Yeshua. He does not want us using that title anymore. It belongs to him and him only now. So to take the title of rabbi or to call another man rabbi is to participate with the false religious practices of Babylon and to open ourselves up to the demonic influence. So let's look at those who use this title and the warning Yeshua gives concerning them. Matthew 23, 1. Then spoke Yeshua to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not you after their works, for they say and do not. So Moses' seat, we've talked about this in the, in the past, it's a bench in all the ancient synagogues where those who were called to the Torah would sit down before reading or after they were reading. We're to obey what they were reading from Moses and not what they add or take away from the Torah. It's not their doctrine, it's what Moses said. So this passage is not telling us that they're the legit legitimate judges of Israel, but that Moses is our standard. And the rest of the chapter should make this obvious. Look at verse 4. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not remove them with one finger. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries, or tefillin it would be in the Hebrew, and enlarge the borders of their garments, their tzitziot, and love the uppermost rooms at feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the marketplace, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi! But be not you called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Messiah, and you are all brethren. And call no man your father upon earth, for one is your father, 
which is in heaven. Neither be you called masters, for one is your master, even the Messiah. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up that kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you them that are entering to go in. Verse 15, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass the sea and land and make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Which means, guys, you're children of hell. This is what the Messiah says in your own religious system. It's time to repent. Embrace Mashiach. He will forgive you. He's paid the price for your sin past. So it's not just the scribes and Pharisees that are children of hell. It's their disciples and their followers as well. Rabbinic Judaism produces children of hell. Catholic Christianity is no better. They're following the other Jesus. And he will not. He didn't pay the price for our sin. It was only the Yeshua of Scripture. Verse 16, Woe to you blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he's a debtor. You fools and blind for whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. Verse 24, you blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Verse 26, you blind Pharisees, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Verse 33, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? You won't if you don't repent. Yeshua goes out of his way to show us that the Pharisees, the leaders of rabbinic Judaism, are blind. They cannot see. If they don't embrace Yeshua, they're blind. They're not blind physically, but spiritually. They don't have any spiritual insight. Their disciples and those who follow their teachings are blind as well. Look at Matthew 15.1. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Yeshua saying, Why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, what profit you might have received from me? It's a gift to God. Sorry, I've dedicated it all to him. Then he needs not honor his father and his mother. And that's what honoring your father and mother is, not doing what they tell you to do that's perverted, not Torah. It's taking care of them with money. That's what he's talking about. They took care of you when you were a kid. You need to take care of them when they're older. That's honoring your parents. Thus you have made the commandments of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, These people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And it's, just not, it's not just Jews, it's Christians as well. Try it by the word, like the Bereans. Make sure it's in the word. Otherwise, reject it. Then his disciples, verse 12, came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Each plant which my Father, Heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. So the reason that these unbelieving scribes and Pharisees, as well as modern rabbinic Jewish leaders and their followers, are in this blinded state, as it's explained in the Torah. There's a prophet like Moses he talked about that was going to be raised up that we can't ignore. It's in Deuteronomy 18, 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. Now, that sounds pretty bad, but it's not quite as strong as what the Septuagint says in verse 19. And whatever man shall not hearken to whatsoever words that prophet shall speak in my name, I will take vengeance on him. That definitely sounds scary. But then the book of Acts shows us the original meaning. Acts 3.22, for Moses truly says to the fathers, Yahweh your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. 
and it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So this is where the Apostle Paul gets his teaching from in Romans 11. These people that have rejected the Jews that rejected Yeshua, they've been broken off because of unbelief. But they can be grafted back in again if they don't abide in the unbelief. Romans 11, 19, you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. We have to have the fear of Yahweh. Rabbinic Jews who have rejected Yeshua as their Messiah have been broken off and are destroyed from among the assembly. They're no longer part of the commonwealth of Israel. Now, we just read in Matthew where Yeshua calls the Pharisees who rejected them blind. They chose the blindness. Yahweh said, okay, well, you can be blind then. Paul gives a second witness, 11.7 from Romans. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day because they rejected Yeshua. You can't have the rest of it without the Mashiach. So the scribes and Pharisees were already blind in Yeshua's day, the blind leading the blind, like he said. The reason for this is because they were following their Babylonian religious system rather than following Yahweh's Torah given through Moses only. They had added to it. Paul gives us more insight as to the condition of the rabbinic Jews today. In 1 Corinthians 10, 32, it says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the assembly. So you've got three groups of people here. Only one of them are in right standing with Yahweh. The other two are lost. Children of the devil. The Jews who have rejected their Messiah Yeshua, they're lost. And they're in a unique category all by themselves. They're not Gentiles. They have circumcised male organs, so they have a sign for an inheritance, but without a circumcised heart, it doesn't do any good. They're children of the devil, just like Yeshua said. Now, they don't have to stay that way. And they're not seen as common Gentiles, but they're no longer part of the assembly either. Now, let's look at Romans 11 again, verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Not all of them were blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. The new covenant's made with Israel and Judah. Not Gentiles. You've got to become part of the commonwealth of Israel. Concerning the Gospels, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And then Romans eleven twenty three, And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. And this is what he desires. He's not willing that any should perish. We need to love them into the kingdom. We need to be praying for them. And for the... Church member that don't know the Torah, we need to pray for them too. And for the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He doesn't want anybody to perish. We've got a lot of work to do, guys. So currently the Messiah rejecting Jews are enemies concerning the gospel. But they are beloved for the sake of the fathers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's a covenant he made. Now our responsibility is to realize that they are enemies. That their writings contain poison. But we are also to love them and seek to share God, Yeshua's good news with them as Paul did. Romans 1, 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Messiah, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So we have a responsibility to share the gospel with, with his people, the Jews, first and then to the Greeks. So what gospel is it that we're supposed to share with our physical brother Judah? Well, Deuteronomy 13, last week's Torah portion, gave us some insight. Verse 1 says, Now it shall come to pass, when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I set before you, and you call them to mind among the nations where Yahweh your God drives you, because you are disobedient, and you return to Yahweh your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul, that Yahweh your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you, and gather you again from all the nations where Yahweh, God of your fathers, has scattered you. Now, this hasn't been fulfilled yet. 
there's a partial fulfillment. We see Jews in the land today. They're there so prophecy can be fulfilled. It's not because they turned to Yahweh and they repented and accepted Yeshua. That's not the case of most Jews today. Only about 20% of them even seek Yahweh in any aspect, and most of them reject Yeshua. So 80% of them are completely secular, couldn't care less about Yahweh. They just want a place where they cannot be persecuted. So verse 4, if any of you are driven out to the furthest parts under heaven from where Yahweh, your God, will gather you, and from there he will bring you, then Yahweh, your God, will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And Yahweh, your God, will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love Yahweh, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. This hasn't happened yet. But this is how we reach Jews. We teach them Torah. They don't resist Torah. They don't follow it, but they know it's theirs. So if we can reach them with Torah and show them Yeshua in the Torah, then they'll know that he is Mashiach and Yahweh will open their eyes. So the broken off natural Jewish branches must first leave their Babylonian substitute religious system of rabbinic Judaism that the Messiah rejecting rabbis established and return to the instructions of Moses in order to see their Messiah. John 5, 46 says, for if you believe Moses, you would believe me for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So they have to go back to Moses first. They have to see Yeshua in Moses. So since we know the rabbinic Jews are enemies for the gospel's sake, we must be wary and heed Messiah's warning. Now, we're to love them and pray for them, just like he said, to give our enemies drink, give them food. We're to, we're to be nice. We're to, we're to pray for them so that they can come in. But then we need to listen to Yeshua, too, because he warned us. Matthew 16, 11, how is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, or in modern terms, the leaven of the rabbis and the Karaites, it's deadly poison. It's a blindness that will jump on you and you'll not even realize that it's happening. It's really the spirit of Antichrist. It looks good. It sounds good, but it's designed to lead you away from the Messiah. First John 2.18 says, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he who denies that Yeshua is the Messiah. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. So the Jews that reject the son, they don't have the father either anymore. They've rejected both because you can't have one without the other. Same thing with Christianity. You can't reject his Torah and have Mashiach because they're one and the same. He who acknowledges the son has the father also. Therefore, let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you and you, you also will abide in the son and in the father. And this is the promise that he has promised us eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. Now realize it's not the people. We're not wrestling with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. It's demonic forces that are driving the blindness. It's not the Jews themselves. It's the spirits behind them. But we've got to be aware it is deadly. So it was the Pharisaic Jews who rejected Messiah Yeshua and left us. They were broken off and destroyed from the assembly. Though they can be grafted in again, we must be very aware of who they are and who they represent presently. The Jews who reject Yeshua are of the spirit of Antichrist. They are enemies for the sake of the gospel of Yeshua, our Messiah. 
They're trying to deceive us. Now realize it's not the Jews themselves. They're being led themselves astray. It's the demons behind them. The demons are trying to deceive us and lead us away from Yeshua. The most do so out of wanting to rescue us from perceived idolatry. When um, Robert Judd and um, oh, the guy you ran off with, what was his name? Alan Kirby. They came into our Messianic synagogue in Tulsa when we had one there. We were doing a Torah service, and they came, and they, they sat there. They wouldn't participate, and then it was all done. At Midrash, it was a spiritual attack like I'd never had before. I had to go back and study everything I'd ever understood about Mashiach because it was spiritually thick. It was demonic, and it was ugly. And even Robert Judd had no respect for Alan Kirby. It was kind of funny. <laughs> He kind of made fun of him almost a little bit while he was they were there. Go ahead. I just wanted to quote one thing, something that answers your question. I like the statement that Yeshua was talking about by taking titles. Mm -hmm. It says right here in the prophet yeah. Isaiah, chapter 42, verses 8, I am Yahweh, and that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, neither my praise to any graven images. That's what people taking these these titles, they're puffing up themselves. Yep. And they are stealing the glory of Yahweh's name. And he will not give it to anybody else. So most do this out of wanting to rescue us from perceived idolatry, the yep. Jews that are trying to win us back. Another important clue for understanding their current state comes from the Messiah in the book of Revelation. Revelation 2 9 says, I know your works, tribulation and poverty. But you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. See, when Yeshua says you're of your father the devil, he's serious, and he is the dividing factor. I know Matthew 23, a lot of people try to say, well, that's just the hypocrites. Well, yeah, that's true, but anybody that rejects Yeshua is a hypocrite. Any Jew that rejects Mashiach, they're not part of the body anymore. That's what Yeshua said. That's what Yahweh says. Revelation 3, 9. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews but are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. So they say they're Jews, but they're not, is what Yeshua says here. But yet they have circumcised male parts. Their mothers were Jewish. So why are they not Jews? Clearly, there's two groups here, the true covenant people and the synagogue of Satan. And in reality, there are true Jews and those who claim to be Jews but are not. Now, in the physical, you would say they were. Maybe they have a ketubah. Maybe they were bar mitzvah. Maybe they have the circumcision. But look at what John says. John 4.22, you worship what you do not know. He's talking to the woman at the well in Samaria. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But it's the true Jews. It's not the synagogue of Satan, obviously. Zechariah 8.23 says, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold of all the languages out of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, or the corner, the kanaf, saying, We will go with you. We, will, we have heard that God is with you. They're grabbing the seat seat. So these scriptures are speaking of the true Jews, not those claiming to be Jews, but are not. True Jews are Jews who are submitted to Yahweh through Yeshua as our true high priest. These are the Jews who Yahweh used to give us his instructions in scripture. Who are the ones that claim to be Jews, but are not? The rabbis would tell us that it's the ones who have embraced Yeshua as the Messiah. They say you're not Jewish anymore if you do that. But Paul gives us the real answer. Romans 2, 28. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor a circumcision, that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart and in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but from God. So we know he's not saying that circumcision in the flesh is not necessary. He's saying circumcision in the heart is necessary to be a Jew because we know in Ezekiel 44 that there's no stranger who's uncircumcised in heart or in flesh that will be able to come into his presence. You've got to have both if you want to see him during the thousand year reign. So circumcision of the heart is what identifies a true Jew. It would be both circumcised flesh and circumcised heart. This now 
come only through embracing Yeshua as our Messiah, as the master and high priest. So you can only have a circumcised heart by embracing him as the priest after Melchizedek. So Yeshua tells us that in no uncertain terms that he is the only way to the Father. In John 14, 6, Yeshua said to him, I am the way, the truth, which is the Torah, and the life. The way would be Jacob's ladder that he saw, angels ascending and descending, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So nobody could ever come to the Father directly. We've always had to have a qualified mediator. The Aaronic priesthood is a picture of this fact. Now look at Hebrews 3.1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Messiah Yeshua, who was faithful to him, who appointed him, as Moses was also faithful in all of his house. So Yeshua is our true high priest, the prophet like Moses. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Messiah Yeshua. Even though he was God, he was here as the man, the last Adam. Everything he did on earth while he was here, until he died and went back to heaven, was as a man. The power of God worked through him, but he did it as a man. And that's the same way we are. We are men, but the power of God still works through us. So Yeshua is our only mediator between us and our Father. There is no other way to the Father except through the true high priest. John 8, 42, Yeshua said unto them, If God were your Father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. And why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And these were the Jews that believed on him to start with. So the rabbinic Jews who rejected their high priest were broken off, and they're no longer part of the commonwealth of Israel. They now have a different father, and they're part of a different kingdom. John 16, 2 says, They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time comes that whoever kills you will think that he does God's service. That's what Paul thought he was doing. And then verse 3, And these things they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. So they are our enemies for the gospel's sake, as they have really never known the Father. The God that they serve is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They call him that. They think it's that. But their fruit is obvious. That's not who he is. They might call him Yahweh, but just like the golden calf, the one that they serve is not Yahweh. Yeshua again shows the distinction between those who follow him and those who do not. In John 15, 18, it says, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Who hated Yeshua? The religious hypocrites. That's who he's calling the world. It wasn't the Romans. The Romans couldn't have cared less, really, unless he caused a bunch of trouble. And then they'd get involved. But it was the religious leaders who hated him. Verse 19, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Verse 20, remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. So there's a contrast he's going between they, the world, and then us. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now they have both seen and hated both me and my father. But this comes to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. And you also shall bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. So Yeshua, again, like, makes a huge contrast between the world, they, and us as the assembly. They is referring to the Jewish leaders, their followers, and all that reject Yeshua, in spite of overwhelming evidence that he is indeed our Messiah. 
Yeshua refers to them as the world. Now, this would include all Tam Talmudic rabbis that rejected Yeshua. If they're children of the devil, why do you want to read their writings? If they couldn't figure out who the Messiah is, why do you think they can tell you about anything else having to do with Yahweh? They've missed it. They proved that they don't have the discernment that it takes. So our job as believers is to bear witness of Yeshua to our lost brothers of Judah. Now, we're not to study their flawed, leavened writings that were inspired by a different God of their substitute religious system. We must not look at them as sages who have some sort of ancient wisdom not obtainable by studying the Torah alone is led by Yahweh's spirit. That's why a lot of people get fascinated with Judaism. We need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We need to heed the warning of our Messiah. Messed up my part here. Let's see if I can get back to it. Yeah. We need to be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We need to heed the warning of our Messiah. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We also need to cut off completely the association with our old pagan system of worship. We need to come out of Babylon and be separate, like he said. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, to hum, sum up the whole matter, fear God and keep his commandments, for that is the duty of everyone. For God will call all of our deeds to judgment, all that is hidden, be it good or bad. We must all choose to walk in obedience or not. We all have to choose. Let's choose life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have blessed us as a kingdom of priests, that you have made us a blessing to the world. I speak blessing over your people, Father. Yivarechecha Yahweh Vayishmarecha Ya'er Yahweh P'navelecha Vihunecha Yesa Yahweh P'navelecha Vayasim lecha Shalom May Yahweh bless you and keep you May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. We are